Hello everyone, welcome back. Chapter two of organic chemistry. Uh, we did chapter one in sort of like a piecewise fashion. We just talked about like nomenclature and chirality and things like that. And it's really like a basic understanding of like all that stuff. So we're just gonna continue on about a little bit of that intro discussion right now. The video after this will be chapter three and chapter four. I'm gonna put them together. But really chapter three and chapter four just introduce you to the fundamentals of organic chemistry. So we're gonna go a little bit off the rails describe a little bit more about these fundamental concepts that you guys need to know so that you guys can know them for the future. And I'll just label it like chapter three and four, fundamentals of organic chemistry. Um, because chapter three, I believe, is like um, bonding, and chapter four is analyzing organic reactions. Uh, so those two things, you really do need like an astute understanding of some of the terms of organic chemistry, as well as why things happen in the order that they do. That's a really important thing. So like, if I were to ask you, right, something like, So I'm sure that you guys can imagine that like the thing that's going to happen here is this attacks that. Like if you've taken organic chemistry before, right? What if I were to put those on the same molecule? It'll attack itself. But will it attack itself before it gets attacked? Now which one happens first? Will it either attack itself or will this happen first? Is this number one or is this number one? You need to know the speed at which things happen. Because if you know organic chemistry, you know that this is going to happen first. It has to. And we'll talk about why. Right? So these are some of the fundamental like, ideas in organic chemistry and why things happen the way that they do. This also relates to like acid strength, base strength, a nuclear felicity, electrophilicity, blah, 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 all that stuff. And before we get there, we need to talk about isomers and how things are built up in the way that they are. Right? So isomers have the same molecular formula. Why do all the markers suck? I see you. Don't worry. Same molecular formula with different The different one, connectivity, that's better. Same molecular formula with different connectivity. Or sorry, sorry, different chemical structure. So structural isomers literally have different connectivity. This is stuff like C6H14. How many ways can I do this? I could do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? I could also do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1. I could also do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1. I can also do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I can also do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So these are all the structural isomers of C6H14. Can you call all of these hexane? No, you can't. They have different names depending on the way that they're bonded to one another, correct? Does that make sense? Yeah. You guys get that? This is if they do not have the same connectivity. If connectivity is the same, these guys are known as stereoisomers. Stereo meaning the orientation in 3D space. That's why it's called stereochemistry, right? It has nothing to do with music, unfortunately or fortunately. Stereoisomers have the same molecular formula. And the same connectivity. Under stereoisomers, we have a couple classes, right? So let's make some room. 
under stereoisomers, we have some classes. First, we have conformational isomers. And these are molecules that can do what? What does it mean to change conformation? Change conformation is just change your shape a little bit. So these molecules can twist and turn into one another. Correct? Something like a chair and a boat can twist and turn into one another. What the hell happened here? Also something like different projections. You guys remember those like Newman? There goes the camera. <laughs> You guys remember those Newman projections where you have like a front plate and a back plate and you'd twist them and like you'd have different, one of them was like eclipsed and one of them was like uh, staggered, right? You remember those? So like let's look at an example of that real quick. You have like a plate and then you have your front plate which is like your H, CH3, H, and then you can also have a back plate like CH3, CH3, CH3. That's like a staggered orientation. And then you can have that same thing without moving the front plate. You can just move, or I guess you would have to move the front. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can move the back plate like. Same connection, different orientation, just moving them over one another so that they eclipse instead of stagger. Right? Very good. Along with stereoisomers, you have configurational isomers. If for conformational isomers, they were able to twist and turn into one another, these isomers require what? Require bond breaking. to turn into one another. All enantiomers lay here. We talked about that in chirality. The mirror image of a chiral carbon makes that enantiomer. So you need to break that position and re rearrange those atoms in order to get that same connectivity. By the way, let's look at something real quick. I want to show you guys something about chirality as a whole. You guys would agree that both those carbon positions are chiral, correct? Because we have an H, a Br, whatever carbon, whatever carbon, right? OK, cool. These guys. are enantiomers, correct? Opposite at every chiral position. Yes? And these guys are enantiomers, opposite at every chiral position, correct? What is the relationship between these two? Diastereomers. So they are different at one or more chiral positions, but not all. Anything less than all of them. They are different at all of them, they must be enantiomers. If they're different at all of them, they must be enantiomers. These are diastereomers, these are enantiomers, these are diastereomers, these are enantiomers, these are diastereomers. And these are diastereomers. See how there's only two pairs of enantiomers? 
diastereomers, diastereomers, uh, diastereomers, and diastereomers. These two are enantiomers. Because this is the, oh god. Okay, fine. One, two, three. This is the S. One, two, three. This is supposed to be S. This is R. This is the SR. That would make this the RS, right? Yeah? This is the SS. This would be the RS. Sorry. My bad. This is the S. Let me do that one more time. BR, one, two, three, clockwise is R. H is in the back. That's going to be S. F, one, two, three, counterclockwise is supposed to be S. That's going to be R, right? And that means that this is R. That means that this is S. And that means that this is S. And that means that this is R. And that means that this is S. And that means that this is R. Why did I say that means that this is? Because I figured out one of them, the opposite is just going to be the opposite. S, S, R, 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 S, S, R. Okay. Remember doing that in bio. It's like R, S, S, R, R, S, 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 R, R. Oh my God. Kill me. Just kill me. Cis trans isomers. These are known as geometric isomers. This is things like. What's the difference between those two? That is true. But more specifically about, you know, let's zoom in on the, you guys okay with these? You guys are fine? Okay. Let's zoom in on that double bond for a second. Actually, like this goes into a little bit of something that a lot of students know in the back of their mind, but they don't like really, really know. And this goes into a question of what we're going to talk about in the next section of the lecture. Because I told you guys this is going to be very short. We're pretty much done. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about resonance. And you may be confused because you're like, Yusuf, that doesn't have any resonance. And you're absolutely right. You're 100% correct, right? Just bear with me for a second. Entertain me for a moment. What is resonance? It is the flow of? Electrons through what? Conjugated p orbital systems. Conjugated means what? You have a bunch of atoms lined up like this. You're going to have a p orbital here and here and here and here. That's a conjugated system. And here and here and here, and here, that's a conjugated system. Are these two conjugated systems connected? Are they? Look very closely. Are they connected? The only thing that can connect conjugated systems is a p orbital. This sp3 carbon in the middle is splitting up the two systems. There's a left system and a right system. And within those two systems, the electrons can hop between the p orbitals. This is how something like benzene works. where the sp2 carbons at every position remember that sp2 and we'll talk about hybridization in the next uh, lecture as well that sp2 if we're looking at our orbital list we say sp2 has that lone p orbital correct so if we have that lone p orbital that means we have a p orbital here and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And the electrons can cycle through those p orbitals. That is what causes aromaticity, correct? OK. This establishes the point that p orbitals really love to attract electrons, correct? Does that make sense? Would you believe me if I told you that you could use that logic to explain why trans double bonds are more stable than cis? Let's explain why. In a trans double bond, Let's actually draw it out the proper way. 
You guys don't need to do this. Just watch. SP2 hybrid orbitals in a flat plane with a perpendicular p orbital that kisses over the top of the molecule to make a double bond. This is your sigma bond. This is your pi bond. Correct? That makes the double bond. We said that we're looking at something like this, where we have methyl groups at the end over here. Yes? That means that I have a bond to a carbon that is tetrahedral. You see that? And on each of those positions is a hydrogen. It's OK if you don't follow right now. Just stick with me. And over here, I have the same thing. I have a bond to a carbon. We have a tetrahedral geometry over here. In the plane, out and into the board, correct? And all of these have hydrogens on them. This is a complicated version of this. You guys see my p orbitals in the middle? These dashed p orbitals? What do we need in order for resonance to happen? We need p orbitals to be parallel to one another, correct? Do you see how these two p orbitals are parallel? And even though they're in a double bond, they're still going to have an essence of electronegativity to them. So they're going to attract electrons insofar as those electrons are parallel to the p orbital. But interestingly enough, in this bond right here, what do you have right here? You have a bonding orbital with two electrons inside of it that is parallel to the level of that p orbital. And because of that, as this orbital spins around at a trillion times per second, because that bond is spinning, remember there's a sigma bond, that bond spins. As it spins, that localized electron density gets pulled towards the p orbital by its electronegativity. It's pulled a little bit, just a tiny bit. And by being pulled, it does a mini version of resonance. This mini resonance with the electron, a slight bit of the electron energy transferring into the p orbital, stabilizing it, this phenomenon is known as hyperconjugation. And only really happens to the best potential when things are trans. Like if this were cis over here, you'd have a bit too much steric hindrance over here with the larger groups, and you wouldn't have as much donation. I forget the specifics of why it's less in the cis and the trans. Like it's, it's all steric effects at the end of the day. This just gives you a better potential for hyperconjugation, which means that the p orbital inside of the sigma bond of the double bond or sorry, the p orbital inside of the pi bond of the double bond is more stable in the trans position because of higher hyperconjugation. I don't remember the specifics of that, but that's why I learned in organic chemistry many years ago now. I remember sitting in this lecture with Professor Malitsky. I was, my mind was blown when he told us this. It works a lot better with like a molecular diagram. I have to upload that video for you guys. Oops. You guys like kind of see that? A little bit. It's just geometry, right? This is why you have to be very visual when you're talking about organic chemistry. So that's double bonds and things like that. And then, yeah, that's it. End of the video. We're done. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.